For this quick tip, I'd like to show you something about particles. So let me first of all give you a brief overview of our setup so that you know what's going on. I have flip here, and we set the bounds to whatever flip's bounds is. So if you just go to sphere right there, you're good to go. Now I've taken another sphere, and I've animated this by using the sine and cosine functions within our center fields. So I have a sine. I'll just say use the frame, multiply by 8, and then take that whole thing and multiply it by 2. Just one of those standard Houdini tricks to uh, get this kind of motion right here. After this, I send this to a ray, and this ray stop is going to project the location of the sphere onto our bounding sphere, so that we essentially have this sort of thing going on. After that, I transform this a few times so that we have a total of four copies that are going around the sphere like so. And this all basically becomes the basis for our emission. We send this to a trail to compute the velocity, scatter some points, and now we're inside the pop net. But here's what you're going to find, and this is what I'd like to talk about. So we're in this particles, right? And look at this issue that we're about to have. We have this weird stepping effect occurring where we have emission and with every single frame it's emitting particles, but there's these weird gaps happening in between. And that's because our emitter is moving really quickly. So anytime you're dealing with an emitter that's moving fast, whether it be something that's flying in the air or, well, like, like I said, anything that's just moving really quickly, you're going to be up against this stepping effect and you'll need to find a way to solve it. Now, whenever we have this stepping effect going on, your first instinct might be to turn up the substeps. The substeps will tell our pop simulation to think about all those in-between frames. So if I went to two, it's going to think about frame one, frame 1 1.5, frame two, 2.5, and so on. And normally within a lot of simulations, this would uh, solve this weird stepping issue. But as you can see, it's actually not solving this at all. It's actually just about as bad as it was before. And so here's what you want to do to fix this stepping issue. Well, here's one way you can do it. We have our emitters, right? Which are these points. And if I go here and I set the uh, visibility to our original emitter points, the issue here is that from frame one to frame two, these points are moving a really far distance from each other, right? I mean, that's what's creating that stepped effect. So what if we took the position of our first frame right here, and we blended that with the second frame so that we have some kind of in-between emission between these two points? Well, that's essentially how we're going to fix this problem. So first of all, in order to capture all the uh, points from the previous frame, we need to throw down a time shift node. So time shift. And with this, we could say $f minus 1 to give us whatever the previous frame was. So if I'm on frame, let's say, 30, and I have this visible, this is actually showing us frame 29. If I set my visibility here before the time shift, now we are at 30. So 30, 29. So we have these two to work with, and now we need to find a way to blend in between these two positions. And in order to do this, we need to create a blend shapes node. So if you're not familiar with what a blend shape is, the main idea is that we have two sets of points. In this case, we have a set of points that is frame 30 and another set of points that's frame 29, right? We want to find a way to blend the position of those two points. So with the slider, I can actually kind of interpolate their positions. So this is the main way that we're going to control that. But as you can see, we don't want to actually just take every single point and blend it the same. We want to blend each individual point a little bit differently so that we have these scattered points kind of existing over here, we have some in the middle, and then we have some all the way blended to a value of one. So with this, we can create a for each point for loop. 
And if you're not familiar with what a for loop is or what this all means, be sure to check out my video on that where I uh, talk about that. But with this for each loop, we're going to run over each individual points. So let's go ahead and plug this blend shape in like so. And right away, what you'll notice is that we actually have a little bit of an issue going on. If I have this blend of zero and I change it to one, it's all just going to try to blend itself into one point. And that's not exactly what we want. The reason why it's doing this is that right now our blend shapes node doesn't know how to compare or doesn't know how to match points from this set with points from this stream. So in other words, we have this stream coming in, which is this group of points. We have this stream coming in, and the blend shape node has no way of knowing how to assign the corresponding points to each other. So what we ought to do is create an attribute to kind of act like a, a name tag for each individual point. If we have this kind of name tag like attribute, then we can tell this blend shape node how to pair up the corresponding points. Let's go ahead and create a point wrangle for this. And the expression is very easy. We're going to create a brand new attribute, that's a float, so f, and we'll call this a ridge ID. And we're going to set this equal to at pt num. And at pt num is an internally recognized attribute by Houdini that says take whatever the point number is and assign it that value. If I go to our geometry spreadsheet, we have our original ID, and now each particle has its own unique name tag. Let's go ahead and copy this ridge ID, control C. Within our blend shapes node, we can now say point ID attribute, plug that in. And now as we go ahead and blend in between, we have a way of pairing up our points nicely. But we're still not there yet. We haven't actually taken all these individual points and you know made them random. We have our blend shapes node working again, which is great. But we need to do one more thing. So within this for each begin block, we need to say create meta import node. Let's move this over a little bit. And if I go to our geometry spreadsheet for this and go to the details, I'm going to take this iteration and use this iteration as a way of telling this blend shape to randomize the value of this blend. So if we say, first of all, if we point to our meta, we say reference scene data, and we select this. Let's first of all, start off by grabbing our attribute. So we'll say attributes global iteration. And now we have this little expression in here, which is great. It grabs that value. I'm going to use this value as a seed for the random function. So the random function gives us a value between 0 and 1, and whatever we put inside of these parentheses will act as a random seed for its value. So now that we do this, we go back here, check this out. Now we have all of these points being randomly placed along here. So this is great. This is how you fix that problem. We now go ahead and plug this into our pop net, and we go ahead and try this out. What you'll find is that we have a much, much cleaner result. So I know this uh, whole quick tip video isn't really so quick as usual, but I do want to give you this bonus section where instead of doing everything we just did, I want to show you how you can achieve everything we just did with a point wrangle. Now, full disclosure, so far I've really been trying to avoid VEX. And the reason for that is that, for one, I want to give VEX a more proper introduction for those of you who are not familiar. But also, I know that for a lot of people it's very intimidating, and uh, the concepts can be kind of hard to get at first. So I'm going to show you how to do this with the point wrangle, and I'm going to try to explain this as uh, simply as I can as we go along and for those of you who don't know VEX yet, this actually might be a great way to start understanding some of the main concepts. Let's create a point wrangle. And as you might remember, a point wrangle is going to iterate over our points. So kind of like this for each point loop, 
It's going to look at each individual point and apply whatever we put in this vex expression to the points. So let's plug that in. And within vex, we have these things called functions. So an example of that would be this function called lerp. And you'll notice that this turned a teal color, saying that this is a function. And if we set our cursor over this and press F1, this will bring up the user manual, which will tell us how we can use this function to affect our points. So this lerp performs a bilinear interpolation between values. So very much like our blend shapes blend one, we basically feed this function two values and then use some sort of way of controlling how those values are interpolated. Kind of like our slider here that we had for blend one. Now, if I go back to the user manual, you'll notice that we need to feed this function arguments in order for it to work. You know, it needs to know what to blend, basically, and how to blend it. So what you'll notice is that in this user manual, there's a bunch of different varieties of how you can use this. For example, we have this float version where we can feed it float values. So value one, value two. The amount can also be a float. We can also feed this vector values, like position, for example. So value one, value two, and then use a float value for our way of mixing things. And well, you get the idea, right? These are just different ways that you can use this function. So we need value one, and this is going to be our first stream. Again, we're trying to compare two sets of points and the positions on those points, right? So if we take value one, and we say, let's use at p. That will give us the argument we need for value 1. Now, we also need value 2 and amounts. And usually, whenever you're using these functions, a great way to feed in these arguments, these are called arguments, by the way, a great way to make these arguments is by filling them in with attributes that you specify above this. So as an example, we need value two. We need the points from this stream right here, which is basically our current frame plus one. Now, in order to get those points, we need to use another function called a point function. And if we look up what this point function does, say point vex function, this is going to read a point attribute value from geometry. So if we look here, we can say the first argument we need is the geometry stream, which in this case needs to be 1. And the reason why I know it's 1 is that when we look at our inputs, we're actually going to start at 0. So this is 0, this is 1, this is 2, this is 3. The reason why it starts at 0 is because that's just a computer programming thing, and that's just how it is. Anyway. Whenever I say one, I'm saying, look at this second input and read from there. Now it needs to know the attribute name. So with this, I'm going to say quotations p. And this is going to grab our position attribute. Now the reason why I know that I should use quotations is because if I go here to our point function, this is a string value, which means that this needs quotations. So do that, comma, we now need to find our point number so that our points function can go through each individual point, and it does this by using ptnum. OK, so we have, our, we have our function right here, our point function, but it's not being stored into any sort of attribute yet. So we're able to grab whatever the position is on our second input, and we're going to store this into a brand new vector attribute called position b. We'll set it equal to whatever that point function comes up with. Now, as you can imagine, we need to feed this lerp function a value 2. So in this case, that value 2 is going to be our position b. OK. Now, last but not least, we need this amount, which is every single time this point wrangle goes over a point, how is it going to blend in between these values? We need something random. So every single time it goes over a point, it's going to choose a different amount, kind of like what we did over here with the iterations, right? 
So for this, let's do the same sort of thing. Let's create a float value. And we'll call this float value randomize. And let's set this equal to the random function. The random function just needs pt num, so that with each individual point, it's going to have a different random value between 0 and 1. If we pass this new attribute, this randomize, into lerp, this will complete our whole function. And now all we need to do is set our new position, so at p, equal to whatever this lerp finds or figures out. And there you go. Now we have the same exact result. The great thing is that there's only three lines of code involved. So this is going to calculate really quickly. If you're working with scenes with millions or maybe even billions of particles, this is the best way to do it because each line of code really counts. Also, I'd like to thank Tomas Molnar for uh, suggesting this point wrangle approach, as well as Kariki on Reddit for, uh, you know, just kind of putting it out there that we can use a point wrangle instead of all this crazy business to do this. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with VEX, don't worry if that was a little too confusing. Hopefully, if you are newer to VEX, that everything I just did makes a bit of uh, sense or helps you understand the thought process behind this. And um, as always, thank you again for watching.